my name is Marco Bovati. Now I'm going to introduce uh, to introduce the guests of uh, tonight. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with uh, Carlos Arroyo and Jean Mars. And we begin uh, uh, in a few minutes with uh, Carlos Arroyo. Carlos Arroyo that comes from, from Spain. He is an architect and linguist and urban planner and researcher. And uh, he comes from Madrid where he leads uh, an office of architecture and urbanism. Uh, I can say a lot of things about Carlos, but I don't want to, to, to take too much time. Uh, I only, uh, with pleasure, uh, I only want to remember uh, one, some years ago when Carlos uh, was uh, in Bergamo, my hometown, and uh, he told uh, in, in a lecture, in a very in a deep lecture, uh, he told a phrase that, uh, a sentence that uh, I, I took, I stole from, from his uh, ideas and I keep in my, in my mind, in my heart. Uh, he said that uh, the, the most sustainable things that we could do is uh, to bore, get really bored and die very soon because uh, uh, too much often we have an idea of sustainability that is very uh, negative. Uh, in this case, Carlos tried to introduce another way to think about sustainability. Uh, his work, uh, his project uh, described by someone uh, as sustainable exuber exuberance. Mm -hmm. Uh, set the frame for uh, a new architectural culture, language, and aesthetics. This is also the title of your uh, lecture tonight. Uh, I only want to say um, that uh, Carlo teaches in uh, Universita Europea de Madrid e Universidad de Alcalá in Madrid too. And uh, he, has, uh, <coughs> he gained a lot of... Uh, uh, international prize uh, and uh, realized a lot of buildings uh, all over the world and uh, his work uh, is uh, uh, also uh, more uh, in books and in magazine uh, all around the world. Uh, after Carlo uh, we will have uh, the lecture of uh, Jean Mas. Jean Mas uh, comes from uh, Paris mm, where uh, he teaches in uh, uh, Ecole d'Architecture de Val de Seine, Ecole Supérieure d'Architecture de Val de Seine, and where he lead um, an architectural office that is called uh, uh, Atelier 234. C'est correct? <laughs> and uh, Jean Mas, in his early years, uh, worked with uh, Richard Mayer and also with uh, Philip Stark. I, I can say that um, the key words of uh, his work uh, uh, are uh, unity, simplicity, strong form, harmony, and density. But uh, the way I think uh, I can say maybe that the way, uh, the way in, in which he think about density is uh, uh, with the intention to transform density into intensity, as, uh, as, as uh, we can say in, in his uh, CV. Uh, he also gained a lot of international prize, but I don't want to, you can find all this uh, precise information on the Miao blog, very, very complete. And uh, so I, give the floor to Carlos Arroyo, and uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I think the message I wanted to, 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 to convey today is uh, um, how to put um, those ideas of uh, sustainable exuberance into practice. Um, we had in the in the workshop we had a theoretical uh, debate yesterday, um, and we went through some books and uh, some ideas. Um, I think today to share with uh, the other groups, um, it would be good to concentrate on 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 the build work of the practice rather than um, the research uh, part or the academic part. Um, sustainable exuberance is the title because. Um, I really do think that what we want to sustain has to be something uh, that makes us happy. And I don't really want to engage in uh, an approach to sustainability that um, 
uh, is gray and boring. So we're trying to find the, colors, the colorful side of it. And, uh, and with that, there are other aspects. So there is sustainability, which is one of the main criteria for us. There, is, there are the, the new things that society needs. Society has evolved, and new architecture is required for that society. So I think that innovation in that sense is also uh, very important. And um, also to do with um, the new layers of uh, uh, the world. We have a physical layer, we have virtual layers, we have uh, all kinds of uh, um, worlds that are overlapping each other. And I think that we also need to innovate in that field. So we need to innovate to, to change the way things are done in terms of energy and carbon footprint. We need to change the way things are done because society is different and we need to change the way things are done because the physical is not the only important thing uh, in our lives. And I'm going to see um, with you three uh, projects, three works. Uh, I'll try to stick to the time, we don't have much. Uh, I'll do my best <laughs> so that uh, we don't have a problem afterwards. Uh, 6.30, okay. <laughs> um, I want to see this project with you. It's a, um, a town hall and civic center in uh, Belgium uh, that's near Bruges, the city of Oostkamp. Um, and here uh, we have uh, uh, the old town and we have a larger area and there's a former industrial uh, um, uh, area with some uh, um, building, uh, industrial buildings, industrial sheds. Uh, specifically, there was this Coca-Cola site um, a, building, a shed built in 1991, so not old enough to be uh, industrial heritage uh, and not old enough to be appreciated as a, from the fetishist point of view. Um, and the city wanted to do, they called it Oost Campus, a campus with all the buildings but with, for all the uh, services of the city. That's the town hall, but also the archive, the registry, uh, the plan, uh, land management agency, uh, free time, the house of the youth, a, a multi-purpose room for uh, concerts and things. So a long list of things to do. And uh, 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 well, in the competition, a lot, most people pull down the factory because what do you do with it, right? Uh, but we looked at it. It's, this is, to give you the scale, this is 90 meters. This is 120 meters. So this is a football pitch, right, in size. And the site, complete site, is four hectares. Um, it's not particularly beautiful, you see, but it's nine meters high, and it's really a, a space that you can do something with. And this summarizes what we saw on the site. Um, we saw foundations. Foundations are not easy to see because they are underground, but they are there. Uh, it's a, a, a concrete slab with industrial uh, load-bearing capacity, tons per square meter, uh, which would be a big effort to demolish and uh, substitute with something else. Uh, sewerage, um, uh, uh, an electrical transformer, axes, walls, structure, insulation, um, waterproofing, all kinds of things that uh, have an embedded gray energy. You know, the energy that has taken, it has taken to have this building here. Now, it has been proven many times, and we did it again, uh, like all the people had done before, that if you have a, an existing structure, the worst thing you can do is leave it as it is. You need to adapt it to a use and to uh, energy efficiency. But the second, the second worst thing you can do is demolish it and build a new building, because if you do that, no matter how efficient the new building is, it could be a zero energy building, it will not save enough energy in its lifetime to pay back for the cost, the energy cost of demolishing the existing. So we wanted to keep this radically at all costs. Do not demolish anything, any part of this building and keep it in place. But, you know, it's not a particularly nice kind of structure. Uh, not yet. I mean, with some time it might be. Uh, so in the competition, we sort of said, proposed to the mayor, we're going to do the town hall here. He was a bit worried. Uh, but don't worry, because um, if you leave the camera where it is, uh, you see the pillar, you see the floor, it will be a, a landscape, a white landscape of clouds, creating a sheltered public space, so like a square, shelter from the rain. This is Belgium. It rains many, many, you know, like 300 days a year. Um, 
So if you can have a space, a public space sheltered from the rain, where you can have then all the various clusters, all the various services, the campus that they wanted, then you will have all the buildings you need, but also something extra, right? So basically we have all the clusters, the various services. We have um, the, this kind of foam uh, uh, of public space, and then the crystallization of the, this foam in the shape of these clouds. How do we build this? Okay, we proposed in the competition to do inflatables. And these inflatables project some gunch, some, uh, this is um, um, glass fiber reinforced gypsum. So it's gypsum with glass fibers inside. It's like the stuff you use to make boats, but not with resin that stinks, but with gypsum that doesn't stink. Um, and this, is, this only needed, needs to be seven millimeter thin, just like this, thin like this, right? And you can also then cut it and work it and finish it and do all kinds of things uh, to inhabit it. And in the end, you get this. This is the built work. Um, it's difficult to imagine that this is a former uh, factory, right? Which is why uh, we have this uh, uh, moving photo where you can see the before and you can see how the bubbles are formed inside the space. I think we can see it again, maybe. Yep, that's the factory. Those are the clusters and then the clouds covering a space that is um, a public space, basically. The floor is the same floor of the existing factory. Here you see how we arranged it. These are the, all the bubbles. Uh, the bubbles are uh, supported by the ground, uh, but also by these cores that are the axis for all the different clusters. That's the, the technical detail. Sometimes they call from magazines and say, can you send us some technical con constructive detail? And we send that. They say, no, can, don't, can't you send some, something more sophisticated? And so, sorry, that's, what, that, that, that's it. There's nothing else. It's just the seven millimeters, a piece of uh, plywood uh, cut with the shape of uh, what the, the Rhino model uh, says, and that's it. And the interaction with the ground is very important and the, um, just make sure that the bubbles are not touching anyone. That's the floor plan, that's the conceptual model. And you can see all the various functions. You can see the city archive, uh, the workshops for the public works, the uh, vehicles, the garage for, to repair the vehicles. Um, there is a hardware part here, there's a public part here, and you can see that the council, the city council, is in the middle of public space. And there are these fingers that intertwine public space with city service. Because there's, there's um, the gray energy issue, but there's also a vision on how you can administrate or govern uh, a city in the 21st century. We're going to see more about that in a minute. I'll just go quickly through pictures of uh, the construction. Um, here I have to say that the price per square meter of this building uh, after it was finished was uh, one third of the usual for a building like this. It was 550 euros per square meter compared to uh, 1600 euros per square meter, which would be the average uh, accepted price in Belgium. One third of the price. That means that we managed to build all the square meters that uh, they wanted, that long list of uh, uses, um, and we didn't even spend all the money that was available for us. I have to say it here because sometimes people look at this picture and say, oh, they have money in Belgium. You know, they, they do town halls, fancy town halls, right? But in fact, this is cheaper because we are reusing what there is. Um, I think sustainability has to be cheaper than non-sustainability. If you spend more money to make something more sustainable, there's something wrong because money and is related to energy. And if you're spending more money, you are spending more energy. So you have a higher carbon footprint. Now, there's construction and then there's using the building, but we can see about that as well. Um, th this man is the, uh, the, the CEO of the city, is the vice mayor or the, the deputy mayor or something like that. Is, you know, the mayor does the openings and the inaugurations. This is the guy who does the work. And he's the, the, the architect, let's say, he's the, uh, the, the author of the, of the um, he has a vision of how the city had to be governed. 
That's why there is a, a council room which is in the middle of public space so that people can see what the politicians are debating and you can actually go in. I mean, if you're going there to the registry, you see that the council is in a meeting, you see what the PowerPoint, you may want to go in and see what's being discussed. And also, the various services are transparent, so you have a clear info point and you can, you can go in there, you can have meetings and, and things will be transparent, things will be seen. Even the info points, they have, this is the website of the city. So you have the info point, you have, and that is uh, the housing department. So you, if you click here in the website, you get this uh, menu, and this is housing, right? So what you have on your laptop at home is the same thing you have when you get there. So when you're at home, you know that you can go physically to the place, and you can talk to the person who's behind the website. And that makes a direct contact between reality and the virtual government, and it facilitates e-government, because it's like the same kind of thing, right? But I'm going to jump out of here to the menu. Um, I want to tell you about the thermal onion. Um, if you have one membrane, loss of energy is exponentially proportional to the thermal jump. So if you have many membranes, the thermal jump is smaller every time, so the speed at which you lose your energy is much slower. So when you have an onion, it's much more efficient from that point of view. But also, you have a smaller area that is climatized, a smaller volume, and it is also more comfortable for people. If you enter a public building, in the first layer, you don't really want to need to take your coat off. It's in the next layer when you want to take your coat off. And then it's only in the places where you're sitting down and working that you need full climatization. So like this, with this system, everybody is comfortable. Some areas are left to go up and down in temperature and it's not a problem. They can be warmer in the, in the summer and they can be cooler in the winter, but never below 16 degrees and never above uh, 27 degrees. Um, and it's where you're working or where you're meeting that you're comfortable enough. And it's only 10% of the volume that is really climatized. Um, I'll skip that. I'll tell you about the topogram. Uh, the topogram is a, a tool that we use. It's a diagram of places. It's a very simple thing. It's uh, something that looks like an organigram, but it describes what spaces there are, how many people you can fit there, what they have to do, what, what are the connections, what are the control points, access points, and it is very useful if you want to discuss spatial arrangements with people who are not trained as architects, but are maybe very capable with uh, workflows, like city people, you know. Um, we always try to find a language, the linguist part of it is uh, maybe affected by that. Uh, we try to find a language that we can communicate with the client, a uh, kind of pidgin language, some in between, uh, and that allows for the conversations to be based on uh, the really important things for the client and not about form. It, it, it's not formal, it's not a formal debate, it's an organizational debate, which is what really matters. And then, if you look at this topogram and I click on, this, on the thing, the final floor plan is the crystallization of those debates. So we could use the topogram to debate we actually had workshops, uh, uh, even with uh, people who do maintenance. Every, everything, uh, everybody who works in this building and everybody who uses the building participated in one workshop or other to give it the final shape, but without discussing form. Now, uh, yeah, I want to go to another one. Um, the bubbles are an interface with uh, the outside uh, environment. And each bubble uh, has a different uh, uh, translation of the outside weather, right? So I want to tell you about the virtual LED sun. We don't have uh, much time, but only, only this one. Um, we are near the North Sea. The weather is, on, in average, quite bad. And when it's uh, bad weather, uh, the wind blows very hard. Now, if you come out from the registry in another climate, you come out to the square, 
and then it's sunshine, and then uh, they launch confetti, and then uh, they take pictures of you. But in this kind of weather, that's uh, very unusual. So we had an interface that uh, visualizes the energy produced by the windmills. There are eolic uh, things uh, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the area. And so the harder the wind blows, the brighter the sun shines on you when you come out from the registry. And I have actually stolen these pictures from Facebook. Um, uh, so these people having their wedding, and when they come out from the registry, they have the sunshine on them. Outside, it's raining cats and dogs, but inside, it's like a, really a square where there is a, a, an inverted kind of um, weather. And I think we need to do uh, this kind of thing to celebrate um, uh, renewable energy also. Okay, uh, I want to tell you also about uh, productive landscapes because it's uh, the theme that we're dealing with. Um, first, let me tell you about grazing fields. Um, uh, well, we did a park. Uh, let me go back. We did a park because what we were supposed to do, this building here, the budget was 6.5 million euros, uh, but uh, the tender was finally won by a contractor for five. 0.5, so 1 million uh, euros below the target. But they had the money, so they said, okay, let's do a park. So I, I did another project for the park for the same money, because the money was proportional to the budget. So I did two projects for the price of one, uh, also in terms of fees. Um, yeah, uh, it happens. Um, and the park is a productive park in many ways. It, uh, it is a place uh, where uh, the choreography of production is celebrated as part of the landscape. Uh, but there's part, part industrial, but also part um, uh, natural. The park is, uh, the gardeners, you can see the gardeners here. Uh, this was the test, the first batch. We did the test, uh, they came in uh, one spring, and uh, just to see how it went, and then there was a trial, a trial, a test uh, uh, sometime in November, and uh, it was good. It was good. Now, this is, uh, this is, um, this is not uh, very sustainable because these are ruminants and they emit um, methane and that's not very good for the planet. But, uh, you know, n um, nobody's perfect. But you see here the park. There's a cow there as well. And you can also see this drainage area with children playing. Uh, let me tell you about water harvesting. Uh, we proposed the roof to harvest water for the building and for the workshops, but also the ground for the vehicles that do the street cleaning. So to fill the tanks of these trucks that go around the city cleaning the streets. And we proved that the investment needed to do that would be uh, paid back in three years. So now, as we speak, uh, they, are, they have free water. And it's a lot of water that the city uses. That's a lot of money that they're saving by harvesting water. Uh, in Belgium, where it rains a, uh, quite a bit. Uh, there's also the salt thing. They had to store, well, no, the, sorry, the, um, the salt thing is here. They had to store salt for the winter, and they had excess soil um, from building sites. So uh, we built a mountain with the excess soil, helping to drain, covering the salt, and also building a grandstand for an events plane. So by using uh, uh, waste and by uh, draining water, we were also creating um, a, a place for maybe they, they do kart races, you know, uh, go kart races there, and they do parties and things like that. Um, and then this is the yard, so th those are the workshop for road maintenance, the green people looking after parks, and they have to store all kinds of materials. So we did this raised bicycle path with all the materials stored against the path so that you can see all these things happening. So the transparency is not only affecting uh, the government and decision making and uh, the relationship between the citizens and the administrators and the, it's also to do with the blue collar kind of part. So you, when, you, you, when you take your bicycle and go past uh, the yards, you can see what they're doing. And this choreography of daily life is also very attractive for people as, as part of this productive landscape thing. And finally, the bicycles uh, have a, a, a major role at the entrance of the building where you can uh, leave your bicycle in the kind of atrium that we created uh, so that, and, and you can see that it's quite successful. Instead of building a building and then doing a bicycle shed outside, 
I think it's important in a culture where you use the bicycle to include that in the building. People don't think about these things, I don't know why, but you need to include the bicycle in an, in an atrium in front of the building. I think, I think it, 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 it's the only thing that makes sense. Okay, I'll jump out to be a bit uh, quick. Uh, tell you about this other project. Uh, it's a, a music school. Well, uh, it's music, word, and dance. That's the uh, MWD thing, music, word, and dance. So it's uh, stage arts. And it's uh, in the periphery of Brussels, um, in an area where there are these uh, um, uh, single-family houses, but next to each other. They pretend to be like farms, but they're not really, because they're too close to each other. Uh, there is this uh, cultural center, which we are now uh, converting. Uh, we got the job to do also the cultural center afterwards as a renovation. Um, monumental building with, uh, this is concrete. It's, 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 it's not that it doesn't, it, it doesn't have windows. I mean, it really is like that because it's a brutalist building from the 70s. And that is like uh, concrete, right? Um, then there is a, a forest, larger than what you see here, that is protected. Um, nature. And then there is a square with a town hall. So we have a crossroads of the urban, the supposedly natural, the domestic and small scale, and the large monumental scale of the cultural center. How do we build a big building in front of these houses, making sense from all sides, but with also a voice of its own? So this is what we did. We did um, a growing scale from the scale of the houses and the shape of the houses to uh, the scale of the monument, looking face to face to the monument and with an abstract shape that will look face to face to the abstract shape. So from farms to abstract, from small to big and also from urban to natural. We're going to see that. This is the suburban feeling. You see the, 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 the um, gables of the houses with the uh, uh, these uh, uh, green things, you see the houses sticking out, and you also see the houses sticking out, you don't really see the building. This is my favorite picture of the building where you don't see it. And as you approach it, you start to realize first that the, the, the forest is a strange forest and the house is a strange forest, and something happens here. I don't want to tell you much about that. It's a piece of music, but anyway. You, you see the forest and the continuity of the forest, but in fact, there are windows there you, do, you don't see. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. You never see this picture, by the way. There's not enough distance to see this piece of music being replayed as you walk. You only see a bit at a time. You only see some colors at a time. You either see the forest or looking in front directly perpendicular, you see the colors or you see, when you look back, the sky and the little houses again from the other side. But the, but the auditorium, this is the auditorium. So the chairs are here. So the slope here is the slope of the chairs looking at the stage here. Looks at the other building face to face and actually creates a space that again is sheltered from the rain. So it's place making. People do things here on Saturdays. They meet here because they know it's shelter or they come out from the academy and they come, uh, they, 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 they're picked up uh, when they come out with their instruments and uh, so that they don't get wet. Um, and this is the only entrance, by the way. Everything else is totally opaque. There is no access from the forest. There is no access not to disturb the uh, small residential buildings. From the forest, you see some kind of reflection. Imagine that you're in the forest and you, you saw some kind of uh, building-like building. Well, you see a non-building-like building. You see a kind of pixelated reflection of the sky and the colors and the clouds uh, and the trees themselves in the windows. And from the other end, you see another house, just another house, right? That's the scale. So that picture was from here. So you see another house here. Just some images of um, construction. Um, we apply principles of passive house here. So we have we try to keep the windows to the minimum necessary uh, to get enough natural light, which is important uh, for the spaces inside. But it is easier to insulate with wall, cheaper and easier and much more efficient to insulate with wall. So we try to maximize the wall and minimize the windows and have the windows at different heights so that you have 
natural light from different angles. But also we need to trap that light into the spaces. We'll see some of that in a minute. Now, the cantilever is the same wall, the same wall, exactly the same wall as thin. It's just that the height gives you enough leverage to hold it in place. And you need that, those cables. I don't know if you see them, that cable there. That's the cable. Uh, to keep the efforts, uh, the horizontal efforts. So the, F, the building doesn't have any extra uh, structure for the cantilever. And then horizontal structure is all wood. Wood is a good way to fix carbon. Um, a mature forest does not fix carbon because it grows but it decays. So it fixes carbon but then it releases it again. If you want to fix carbon, you need to um, responsibly harvest trees and store the wood somewhere where it will not be, the carbon will not be released back into the atmosphere. So building with wood is a very good way, as long as it is uh, FSC certified or responsibly harvested, of course, um, because there are other issues apart from carbon fixing. There are env other environmental issues in, in terms of footprint. Um, it's a good way to store um, carbon. Um, I don't want to tell you very much about all the other things. Yeah, but I want to tell you this. You see, this is how it works. Um, uh, super insulation, uh, airtight uh, connections with windows, making sure that you don't lose air th uh, through the walls, which you do. In this building, you're losing air through the walls and heat through the walls. Not just heat, but air as well. And then capturing the light with the reflection on these fins. So we had to include some fins here to reflect the light back into the space. It's like having a thick wall and then having light, diffuse light coming from different places. So we need super insulation, we need protection to the super insulation and we need to capture light in. So that's why we have the fins. And the fins are also helping us to uh, uh, build a different kind of image to the building. So it's not a huge building-like thing. Uh, in front of the houses. This is the forest being uh, encapsulated and the forest being put on the wall and built to, to build the continuity of the forest, which, by the way, are always green. Now, there are different uh, results uh, in terms of the look of the building depending on how the light, you see the light reflecting there. When it reflects you get the colors reflected onto the greenery and you get this kind of uh, image which I quite like. Now this building, uh, the target price was 1600 uh, euros per square meter and the final cost uh, without the um, auditorium uh, technical, uh, specifically technical features was 900 euros per square meter, which in Belgium is really very reasonable. Um, and that is the opening uh, party. Now, I want to quickly tell you about another project <coughs> uh, which we're working on here in uh, Rwanda, in, in Kigali, the capital of uh, Rwanda. This is a, a um, um, it's called uh, uh, the, the gateway to the Kigali business district. So they're building a business district there. Uh, Kigali is trying to turn into a, a kind of IT hub for uh, the East Africa community. Rwanda is, there was a civil war 20 years ago, but um, there's growth in the order of 8 to 10% uh, GDP every year in the last decade. So it's a fast growing country and the fastness is based on um, uh, this IT thing. So everything you do is online. Um, I do my planning permission things online um, uh, and you get the answer in 15 days. So they're really, uh, uh, banking is done with mobile phones and uh, really advanced in many ways. I mean, I say Rwanda and people think, oh, you're working with an ONG or something. And it's not really like that. We have uh, 10 projects in Rwanda at the moment. And uh, it's, it's all very exciting the way um, uh, people are open to new ways to deal with things. And they don't have the, um, the, the inertia of systems that have been uh, developed in the last 100 years. They can do everything from new. 
And we're doing this, this project here. It's uh, offices uh, next to the equator where comfort is reached without air conditioning. That was one of our uh, things we wanted really to do. Electricity is very expensive and we really want, I mean, this building will use 75% uh, less electricity than a normal building. Yeah, 75% less running costs. And how do we do that? Yeah, 15 minutes, <laughs> maybe 10 minutes. How do we do that? Uh, well, first we need to look at the climate. This is a, a, a tower there, one of the towers that uh, is already standing in Kigali. You see they build greenhouses and they, then they need to open the windows to ventilate because uh, air conditioning is too expensive. And then you get dust inside. This is another one. This is, this is called Kigali City Tower. Uh, and you can see that they have opened the windows to try to clean the dust around and then they, they like, you know, try to clean also around, uh, you know, bend, uh, get the arm out to, to bend something to get some clear views outside. So we have a double problem. With the greenhouse buildings, we have the air conditioning and we have the dust, right? Now, the way to approach this for us is first look at orientation. Uh, near the equator, the sun is very high. So we get very high solar angles north and south. North and south are exchangeable. It's the same thing. It's just that the south behaves like, this, like what we think is the south in December, and the north behaves like what we think is the south in, uh, in July, right? Always very high. So if you have an abstract uh, cube, if you block east and west and the roof, of course, with vertical screening, and if you um, screen the uh, south and north with uh, uh, horizontal screening, you're okay. It's very easy to control solar gains. Uh, it's much easier than in northern Europe where uh, uh, the sunshine can be uh, very horizontal in the summer as well. Now, you don't always uh, you're not always able to have uh, this uh, orientation and then you get solar angles also uh, um, that are low on this side. So our, our strategy is, okay, we have a ground floor, we need to uh, adapt to that shape because we want to be aligned with the street and optimize the use of the ground commercial floors, but we want the top of the tower to reach this kind of shape. Uh, so what we do is we make it um, evolve from one shape to the other and we get this kind of shape. And then we have some sides that are not really very good. So we put these boxes that are opaque to the east and west but open completely to the north and south. And that is how we get this kind of abstract and kind of general uh, shape. Then we balance um, uh, shading, vertical screening and views if you, have a, if you have an office on a, on, a, on, a, on a 15th floor, you want to have views, so you don't want to have everything screened. So we balance it to make sure that we have 70% uh, good screening with plants. Now, what other thing are we doing? Um, this is a graph of the temperature every day. Um, it goes up every day through the year, and at night it goes down every day through the year. So if we can... Uh, screen ourselves from solar gains and we can store the heat, uh, sorry, the cold of the night, we can have a very good average temperature inside our building, right? So what we have is a ventilation system that is based on, let me go back to the strategies, the structure. The structure uh, is um, a hollow core slab. Uh, no pillars, there's just a, perimetro, a, 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 a peripheral beam and the core. And we have a hollow core slab where the cores are used as ducts for air to circulate. Yeah? So we're making this lab light to save concrete and weight, and we're making the air circulate through it to, let me go back to the climate, uh, let me go back to the climate, uh, to, do, 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 to, cool down the structure during the night. So during the night, we circulate the cold air through this lab and then it goes out into the street. And during the day, we have a cold structure. Then during the day, we get air renewal through another circuit, the green one, uh, controlling humidity. This air is dehumidified. 
And um, because humidity is what uh, helps you achieve, controlling humidity helps you control comfort. And then you renew the air and uh, with air that has been cooled down also by the structure and then it goes out, uh, leaving, um, uh, getting all the uh, toxics out and all the people's breathing out. And also um, very slow speed and also uh, helping redirect the heat generated by people and by computers. That's, that's the system uh, that we have. We did a computer model and we know exactly that this is actually uh, working every single hour of the year. Now, we do that, control that with the skin. The skin is multi-layered and we have... Um, now, logistics are very important in Rwanda. It's in the center of Africa and anything that's imported has to travel by container to Dar es Salaam and then it has to travel by road uh, thousands of kilometers into the heart of Africa. So if you import something from Europe or from China, you have to pay an incredible amount of money to get it to your site. So one of the strategies for us is to minimize imports. So if we want to minimize imports, how do we do, why should we do a curtain wall that has to be imported, aluminum profiles, expensive? Uh, what else can we do except importing uh, 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 that kind of uh, curtain wall. Um, how can we do vertical screening and not importing uh, louvers or panels? So what we decided was to import only um, a mesh where plants could grow. The plants are there to do the vertical screening. So they're not there to make it a green building because the leaves are green. They're there to do the vertical screening. It's also a passion fruit plantation. So the gardeners that do the maintenance, they, they harvest the passion fruit and get the revenue out of it. Now, the steel mesh does also the security. So people can go through this corridor. Let me show you there. So the, the gardeners can go through there and maintain um, the vertical screening, but also the cleaners can clean from the outside without needing fancy things that go up and down and uh, especially trained personnel but also the security from the point of view of people falling off and therefore we can do very simple uh, frames. We don't need special glass or special frames um, to keep people inside the office safe. We just have, so we are only importing this mesh that is a roll, very light, just one container will bring us the facade for the whole building. Then we can use wood that can be uh, re responsibly harvested locally. We just need to make it fireproof. Uh, and we have the right uh, uh, products that are also uh, low um, impact from the environmental point of view to keep them fireproof. Um, then we can have this uh, screening plantation and we're basically minimizing the import. And that is how we are building the image of the building as well. So this is a green building, not because it's, I mean, uh, when these flowers are in flower, it will not be this color. Um, it's green because we are using minimum electricity, um, we are minimizing imports, um, we are using local materials, we are creating local business opportunities for people who can develop uh, woodwork and wood panels and things like that. Um, and we are basically uh, maximizing uh, natural light, minimizing the needs for electric light, um, and let me go back to the uh, strategies and controlling orientation, harvesting water. That's why it's a green building, not because it has plants around it. The water we harvest, sorry, why? the water we harvest, uh, it rains a lot in the rainy season, but then there is a dry season. And we need to look after the plants. They need water in the dry season. So what we do is we have this system. We have city water only for human contact, only for the wash basins and maybe the kitchen. That water is then grey water that we clean and it goes to storage together uh, to go to the toilets. Now, if you've done anything like this before, you know that the water you need here is much less than the water you need there. So you need more water that we harvest from the roof. When it rains, it does rain. Now, this water goes here and we have a biodigester that produces more grey water that is recycled again and water full of organic components that we use for irrigation of the facade. 
the plants eat the organic components. And uh, so we have irrigation and food for the plants and also phytodepuration so that we can then send this directly to the wetlands. So, uh, Kigali is hills and uh, on the lower part of the hills there are wetlands. And if we put water there that is almost clean, the wetlands will finish the phytodepuration. So basically we have no waste, no sewage. We, we use the water three times and then the fourth time we use it to feed the plants and to water the plants in the dry season. When it rains, it rains a lot. So on the top of a tower, we can harvest enough water to go through the dry season. We store it in the foundations. The foundations are a waffle and we need a, a certain uh, distance to have this waffle uh, uh, um, uh, spread over the base of the building. And we use the holes in the waffle to store the water so that we have enough space and we don't need to build extra tanks. Okay, um, let me just show you the site. Those are towers that are already there. And this will all be towers in the future. And in fact, um, that's uh, KCT. This will all be towers in the future. All the towers are already there. This is the project. And this is what it will look like eventually. I think I can drop it here. Thank you very much, and I give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. I hope some of you are going to stay. I, I I'm promise I will try to be strictly in the 40 minutes or 45 minutes. Where is it? The large screen is here. No. Can somebody help me to have uh, it full screen, please? Here. Yeah, thank you. Um, movement and depth. I'm going to try to speak first of all uh, about from where I come and uh, where and how I was built as an architect. I mean uh, in the early years uh, when I was a student like you, when I went to work abroad, for example, with Richard Meyer, what did I learn from this? And I think from what I can uh, still uh, recognize being my experience. I'm very interested in the two things uh, about architecture, which is how we move and how we have the desire, because there is a depth in architecture to, to move, and exactly to move in different ways, sometimes to climb the building, sometimes to cross the building inside. I'm going to try to explain that the best I can. Uh, of course, this has, is directly related to our body, and uh, I'm sorry, I put the chronometer so it will be easier. And uh, we are very interested in France. And I was really, uh, I had a lot of teachers explaining to us what the, the 20th century learned to us about uh, phenomenology, uh, phenomenology de la perception from Merleau-Ponty and all different old philosophers. Uh, I'm sorry I could not translate this sentence in English before this presentation, but it speaks about the fact that it's not only important to uh, to see something, and especially in a time where a lot of images of architecture are so strong, but it's mostly important to understand from where you see, what you see, and what you see, and what you want to see. So, of course, you know this uh, painting from Velázquez and you know what Michel Foucault uh, was explaining about that. I'm not going to spend a long time about that, but uh, that was the first time in painting where a painter was explaining uh, the question of the depths and 
the fact that you think that you look from some place the 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 painting but in fact there are many positions uh, from where you can think you look at this picture at this, this painting and of course i relate this to alberti uh, who thought that as uh, descartes who's also a french philosopher very important that the vision is only a vision with lines. Uh, there is a ray, you can imagine that a strong form, I'm going to speak a lot about strong form too, like a cube, for example, gives uh, different points and that if you rely these points to your eye, there is a direct line that gives a fixed vision. But I'm interested, of course, with this kind of vision, but I'm interested also in uh, the fact that when you move, and we're going to see a small film later, uh, the, the vision is completely different compared to this fixed vision from uh, Alberti. I put the cover of this book because I was a teacher a long time ago in Geneva and uh, in Lausanne too, and in the uh, United States also in America because I worked, uh, as I said before, uh, with Richard Meyer, Richard Meyer for a long time. and. Uh, this book in peculiar, this book from Martin Steinmann, Ma Martin Steinmann uh, uh, is uh, a very strong uh, um, intellectual uh, guy from uh, the school of uh, Lausanne, the l'école Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, and he wrote this book uh, to explain what uh, each generation of very strong uh, uh, and young uh, uh, at that mo moment uh, Swiss architect did about this question of form. Le Corbusier uh, spoke about that a long time ago also, trying to explain that he could relate his work about simplicity, unity, uh, strong strengths of the form, to a classical vocab vocabulary where, uh, as you see here, cylinders, pyramid, uh, cubes, whatever, uh, were already used because they were strong. And I'm very interested in this and I'm very interested also uh, with these uh, famous sketches, these famous sketches from Le Corbusier, where he tries to explain in very schematic uh, design uh, what is this essential question of the form for architects. Of course, you can have the program complex that becomes a complex form, but you can also try to have a very strong and simple form with a complex uh, program. And uh, I always relate this to uh, another work that the conceptual American uh, artists sometimes were trying to explain, and also I'm going to speak about uh, a Spanish very famous sculpture. Uh, how, uh, as a cubist people, they try to uh, open the form. And uh, if some of you know the work of uh, Sol Lewitt, uh, he was trying to explain 122 variation of incomplete open cube. The idea is to open a cube, and the idea is how can you, in fact, give the feeling of the cube still without the cube, just with lines. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, thing that I try to relate with my, my work. Also, strong form, the form that Le Corbusier was trying to point out, is related to something that I like very much, which is uh, this Chinese kind of uh, enigma, where you can put together different forms, different shapes, shapes, it's like a game. But in the end, you get a solid form, which is a very strong form, but you can understand easily that this form, and this is why I relate this with uh, Sol Lewitt work, is in fact a very complex thing that gives, in the end, uh, when you work on the complexity, uh, a very strong form, uh, but still with the complex program. And so I try to relate these two forms from Le Corbusier, the form number two and the form number four, uh, the four is being uh, Villa Savoie, of course, with something where you could have uh, a very uh, strong form like a cube or a parapipedic form, but in fact, uh, as the Chinese enigma, related in two directions, the solid and the void. And you can see here, I tried to explain that the best, that these two categories that are 
two archetypes, in fact, for architects since such a long time. The pavilion uh, with the solid in the center and the void around, and the court with the void inside and uh, the solid all around. And I think our work together uh, today is to try to make a very strong form, but to articulate, in fact, the void form and the solid form as the Chinese enigma that I was showing before, uh, as in the final, the perfect, solid and strong form that Martin Steinmann is uh, speaking about and that Le Corbusier was pointing out in his famous uh, sketches. And another very strong issue I see uh, in this is that we could relate this to a fact that uh, because Le Corbusier was speaking about the architectural promenade, the void inside this uh, double uh, void and solid form uh, put together, the void would be the promenade inside the building, going up. And I relate this also to uh, the work that, uh, of course, Colas did in uh, Porto for Casa di Musica. Uh, and of course, always the idea of uh, the promenade and the fact that a building can be a very strong form, uh, form that is structured from inside, but always, always, always think about movement and uh, about the fact that you cross a building and in some point you finish uh, sometimes on the top of the building. Being on the top of the building, being in, on the top of a city is something that has always interested me too. Uh, I like very much this image of a long time ago uh, of Montmartre because the desire to go up is immediate when you see this picture and when you are in this specific uh, uh, place of the city you can imagine of course uh, just before you start climbing that on the top of it you're going to have a magnificent view and this question of the desire and the, of the depths here, it's a depth, very special, uh, there's a depth going up. It's something I try to work in my projects. Of course, I told you I worked with Richard Meyer, and so I was really structured as himself is structured. That means that I believe, I believe a lot that as uh, many architects, uh, architecture has to be structured from inside. You know the sketches from uh, Richard Mayer. I'm not going to speak a long time about it, but uh, that has built me as an architect very strongly. And uh, this is a picture very interesting that I rely also to the house, uh, Joinity House, on which I worked with Richard Mayer. And this is a work of a Spanish, very, very famous, one of the most famous Spanish uh, sculpture, which is Jorge Oteiza, that probably a lot of you here know. Uh, which I think uh, really uh, makes a thing that sculpture and architecture can be thought together. Oteiza, you know, uh, probably uh, uh, his work, and uh, you can rely this to the images I showed before from uh, Sol Lewitt, and also from the idea of strong form that is developed with Martin Steinman. But here, a little bit more in a complicated way than the cubist matter, uh, Oteza tried to keep the idea of the cube, but uh, with uh, tools, very simple tools, folding, opening out, and folding over, uh, trying to either open or to close this strong form from the inside to the outside. And I remember that I worked a lot when I was at Richard Meyer with a very incredible space that I invite you to look uh, on our computers, which is the Atlanta High Museum of Art, where you have this incredible atrium, where the, you have also this incredible curved ramp folding uh, around this public space inside the project. The idea of a public space, of course, being very, very strong for our work. So I'm going to try to speak about my projects after this kind of introduction. I'm going to show three unbuilt projects that are either competitions and uh, or uh, different sketches and one project which has been built. Uh, we have built many other projects but I think it's good to show projects. Uh, this is a project for a tower, a competition for a tower in Paris. You see here the River Seine, you have here the Louvre, 
and you have the boulevard périphérique. The boulevard périphérique with the arrival of a very important highway going to the airport, the main airport, which is the Roissy Charles de Gaulle. So this tower is in a place very specific, which is lined up with the boulevard périphérique. And at the crossing, in fact, uh, the arrival of this uh, highway A3 that goes directly to the airport. And the site is a very complex site, as you see, uh, directly related to this highway, directly related to this incredible space where you have a commercial center, a mall uh, in the middle. And we, what we wanted to do here was to explain that the tower here should try to relate to its context. And you see immediately here that there are three dire directions integrated in the tower itself that are precisely the south, the north, and the east, that all these highways connected at this place uh, shows. And that could relate to an idea that the tower could be, in a way, a signage uh, post. This is a sketch showing that. And we had two elements of program for this uh, tower. One hotel, that was a low building, and the tower, which is a 120 meter high uh, tower. Of course, I'm not going to speak as brilliantly as uh, Carlos about uh, sustainability, but uh, our building have to be uh, uh, today very performant about uh, sustainability. I'm not going to speak about all the technical issues and all the uh, things we work about it, but one main thing I think, this is why also we relate our work to strong form from anti-inside mind, is that you know for sure that the most proportion of envelope you have and the most difficult it is to keep a good performance for, for a building. So each time we try to work the form, here we, we were trying to study the form of the tower, and uh, we studied from the very beginning very simple and very elementary form. As you know, of course, the circle has the most performant uh, relationship between the envelope and the, the area, but the triangle is not bad at all. And because we wanted to indicate these three directions, we finally decided to keep the triangle as uh, the base for our tower. And the basic plan for the tower was, as usually, a core in the middle and a place developing outside. But what you're going to see is, on the heights, each element, the tower will be divided in heights, and each element will turn 120 degrees each time you jump from one layer to the upper layer. That's a sketch uh, trying to show uh, the basic formal image we wanted to show uh, about this tower, which was not really a very vertical element, mostly something where would you would have overlaid uh, three elements, and uh, the hotel being a kind of l shape opening like a uh, an enclosed form uh, on the courtyard in the back where you could enter this tower. So you see the plane in, in the bottom part and the upper part. And this is a small model that shows how uh, this tower relate to its context. And uh, you can see it now. Uh, a very important thing also is that uh, I don't know if this tower is, is going to be built because the Meyer has changed and he hates towers, but uh, if the tower will be built, we are going to, to fight because we want really this tower to be white also. You see that all towers are green or black, and it's very important for us to try to work on a white ID for this tower. This is the image the tower would give from the boulevard périphérique on the upper part. And you see clearly what we try to do. We try to explain that the tower is not only a simple plan repeated exactly the same on uh, 30 or 40 levels, but we can change and have different blocks overlaid one over the other one with different transparency. And also, what I tried to explain in the beginning, different direction explained by these big cantilevers. Here we are talking about 14 meters cantil cantilever, so it's something really that has an impact on the urban, an urban vision of such a building, which I hope 
will be really different from what we know about towers in Paris. Another project was an existing transformation, uh, existing building that we were supposed to transform. And uh, on the left, you see the existing buildings, and on the right side, what we tried to do with this building, which is also in a very strong and nice location, is near the River Seine, also in Paris. You can see this really boring uh, shape and boring form an envelope, but the envelope is completely closed. You have no relationship at all between the inside and the outside. Uh, it's on the main axis est-west of Paris. Uh, you have the Champs Elysees, you have the Arc de Triomphe, Port Maillot, and then you have the river before La Défense. And the position of this building is exactly here on the main east-west Parisian axis and uh, uh, near the, the river with beautiful views, of course, on the upper part to Paris. And uh, the building at the beginning was connected uh, with, uh, without any relationship between the low part and the, up, and the upper part. We decided to divide clearly the two parts uh, to open a courtyard in the middle and to be able to have a garden between the higher part and the lower part. And the main uh, movement uh, that we wanted to do and to inscribe, as I said before, a, a new depth in the building instead to having a flat uh, envelope. Then in dividing uh, the heights and in trying to, to shift uh, each block, horizontally speaking, we can at the same time change completely the feeling about this project, but we can also create very intense and very intelligent terraces, outside terraces, so that an office building could become something where in the, few, in the past you were not able to do anything else that opened you, your window when you had a window, because uh, a long time ago you didn't have any window. Here you would have doors and you would be able at certain levels to go out. We would see that, we are going to see that later very nice terraces, outside terraces with trees. So this is a new image we want to give for this project and we won this competition. The, being, the building is going to be under construction soon with, as you see, a lot of terraces uh, for a restaurant near the river, the entrance, and also for the, all the offices space where the new thing, of course, is that we want to change completely the relationship of uh, an office building with the exterior. I try to go fast um, because I know I don't have much time. There's a lot to say, but uh, I think the images are clear. This is a plan where you see the low building and the upper building in the entrance and the courtyard inside, and you see here the terraces. Terraces sometimes are bridges uh, between the low and the upper part. And this is the image that we, you, we're going to have from the river, where you can see these trees, you can see uh, the relationship that the offices can have with exterior terraces. And you can see also what the inhabitants of this building can have to, at night on the upper terrace, uh, the vision of Paris, the vision of this main axis est-west with the uh, Arc de Triomphe, Eiffel Tower, Tour Montparnasse, whatever. The third project that I want to show is still an office building uh, in the, a very important new area of Paris, which is called Paris Rive Gauche, uh, near Gare d'Austerlitz. Uh, the Gare d'Austerlitz station is one of the most important stations in Paris, uh, railway station, and you have the River Seine, and you have the Parc de Bercy, uh, and Gare de Lyon a little bit further. The important thing is that uh, it's a completely new soil. Uh, the railway company decided to build a concrete floor over the railways uh, to be able to build new building over the trains. And uh, I wanted, wh when I started this competition, I, r I reminded me uh, a souvenir that I had from uh, New York when I was working at Richard Meyer, which is uh, an incredible office building that of course you know also, the Ford Foundation. And uh, the Ford Foundation is a place where you have an office building and you have a garden inside. You have something that mixed 
as I tried to design in the very beginning, the void and the solid, all together in a very strong form because the Ford Foundation, in fact, in the end, is a single cube inside which you have a green garden cube and an L-shape office building all around this uh, uh, garden. But the interesting thing, of course, you see here, is that you are in, in an office and you discover uh, the volume that belongs, of course, to the headquarters of the Ford Foundation. So I really wanted, when I started this competition, that we won to give an homage to the Ford Foundation and to try to find in Paris a place where an office building could have an interior garden like this that would be also a public space so that inhabitants of the neighborhoods uh, could enter this garden and share with the office building this interior space. This is the exact location. You see the Gare d'Austerlitz here, and you see the specific position that's just nearby to the station, and the direct relationship to the river, Seine, in, in this diagonal, and directly over the, the railways. You have a very important historical building here, with a dome, like the dome here in Milano, and the architects in chief of this area decided that we should keep an eye on this depth again and rely strongly this building, you're going to see that in the movie in the end, to this dome uh, that we try to do our best. So again, uh, Oteiza, Oteiza, because we tried as much as we could to make a single strong form with only one skin and the single skin should be multiplied in, in terms of foldings so that uh, when we start with uh, oh, this, I'm going to talk about the skin later, but uh, this is to explain the relationship between uh, this U shape where the, you would have inside a small garden and a small public plaza uh, that is related in depth to uh, the, the famous dome I showed to you uh, in the plan. This is what gives the project in terms of uh, form, in terms of volume. Uh, Bernard Reichen, the architect in chief, decided that he, we wanted to have three different layers. You can see layer one, layer two, and layer three. The red things I'm going to talk about is the intervention, the, uh, the position of an artistic work I want to include in the project with uh, a uh, young uh, woman, an artist, a very brilliant artist uh, in France who works on uh, colored light. I'm going to show, light, show that later. So we had an ur urban window, very strong urban window on the dome. We had this vertical promenade on the central void. And we started to work the envelope as a very simple and linear um, plan that we start folding once, twice, three times, four times, and this thing else, skin, in a way, is going to be the, the only and single proof that this is a strong form, where you can enclose with this form and with this skin that uh, is falling out uh, over uh, this atrium, uh, the final building. So in section, uh, you have this garden inside with real trees, uh, that are planted in this uh, outside and inside uh, space. You can see that this space is directly related to the sidewalk and we want to have a cafe here which belongs at the same time to a kind of public space and at the same time which is a cafe for the office building. Of course, we had a strong study about natural ventilation and the way we can refresh this uh, uh, interior space which is not heated in winter this is important to say and this is a vision from the railway station and then I'm, I'm going to try to show the movie where these two questions two main important questions about depth and movement are the central question of this project as you see we are in the avenue and we are going to discover the depths of the dome which is opposite to the project. So you cross this public plaza with these trees and you go a little bit up, you start this climbing promenade and you discover a magnificent terrace with the dome with a cafeteria next to it. 
you make a U-turn and you're going to take the glass elevators that are in the center of this uh, public atrium. And going up in the elevators, you still keep the view on this dome and magnificent exterior terraces, again with trees. Remind, remember, this is an office building. And the, in the end, and this is where you have the final depths and the final movement, you discover the River Seine, uh, Montmartre, uh, Sacré-Cœur, and different bridges. And I try in this movie to explain strongly, as, uh, as strong as I could, how I am interested in this idea that the building, in fact, you can explain it with a magnificent image fixed, but I prefer, of course, as you see here, uh, show uh, the building with the movement itself, because uh, our way we make uh, this project is uh, with the movement, of course. So I have to go back to this, I think. Thank you. And one, uh, also uh, a work, I'm sorry, the proportion of the horizontal, no, it's good on your screen. I'm sorry, it's not good on mine. Uh, we tried a, a materiality of the project, which is anodiz anodized metal, uh, an anodized aluminum, which is a little bit black. So in the morning, it's very reflecting for the natural light, and uh, at night, it's becoming more contrasted and black. The work of the artist, which is named Nathalie Junot Ponsard, is to integrate images that are going to change with different lights. You see it on the bottom part of the building here. You see it on the upper part at the end of the folding system. And this system will allow the building also to be intense, not only with the interior plaza that you saw, which is a public plaza, but also with this work from the artist at night that will change in terms of color because it's uh, red here, but it moves, becomes yellow, green, different images. And this arrives to the last project I want to show to you, which is a, a built project. I'm going to start with a section, again with the question of the movement and of the depths. This project is also a competition we win, which is a very important cultural progr program in uh, the west uh, side of Paris. All the projects I show here are very dense projects. And the question of density, the question of leaving p enough public space is a very important question. Why do I show these two stairs, one over the other, uh, an exterior stair and an interior stair? I'm going to explain that later. The location of this project is Courbevoie. Courbevoie is near La Défense, again on the main axis of Paris. And Courbevoie had a program of two very, very important uh, cultural uh, spaces. One uh, space for 1,000 spectators and another one for 300 spectators. So we decided to divide the project in two. And considering the context around the stadium, we won the competition, I think, for two reasons. One, because we left a very important public space, a new plaza, a mineral plaza, that was not existing in Courbevoie in front of the building at the south orientation. And another one, I, I'm trying to explain that also, is because we said that the stadium at the back was not only the back side of the building, but was a real landscape around which, urban landscape, around which all these buildings could share the void inside. Remember the pavilion and the court. So we split the program in two. Then we decided that because the existing buildings has al also already twisted uh, this one 45 degrees and the other one also, we decided to relate these two buildings uh, with the other ones existing and to allow the existing buildings to keep the view on the landscape of the stadium. In, the, in between, we had a very important transparency between these major uh, public space and the uh, landscape of the stadium. I'm trying to show that. And on the competition, we won also this uh, second building, which is a services building for the Maya, for the city, with a, sta a railway station here. And when you arrive to this building, you have to cross this uh, garden and enter the building here. 
this is the side plan, the final side plan, where you try to see the complex form in the end that gives this building with uh, uh, veg uh, vegetal soil on the top of them and uh, the entrance system that relates this new public place plaza with the uh, railway station on the back. This is uh, uh, the service building. This is when you arrive and you see it from uh, the pass from the station to go to the stadium. This is the building showed from the stadium itself. I'm not going to insist uh, a lot on this building, which is complex, a lot of terraces again. But what is important is to understand that all the stairs were exterior to allow the families to go from all the different and mixed program used inside the section of this building. You see uh, on the bottom uh, an important uh, gymnase, sport area related with natural light and related with, uh, with the sky here. And the restaurant also that we decided instead of uh, addressing the restaurant to the road, we said that the landscape you see here of the stadium was a beautiful landscape, a beautiful view for the city restaurant. And the color, uh, we decided also to work with the sun protection because this facade is mainly west oriented. So we had a lot of work to do uh, with vertical elements and we decided to use color for this solar protection. This is the image we gave uh, from the other building uh, during the competition when we won the competition. You see here the major exterior stair that go to a kind of summit here to have a kind of a view, a direct view uh, on the stadium inside. And you see also a kind of frame in between the two very solid and strong forms, that is uh, 1,000 uh, spectators uh, main room and uh, 300 spectators uh, other main room. This is a plan where you see in the middle the big atrium which is quite open and di in direct connection with the main plaza that we did in the south. This is the, the upper floor with the, the, s the exterior stair that you go you see going up until the Belvedere that will be over this space. And you see a very important space in the middle, which I call the Agora or the atrium. That reminded me, you see this space here in section with the main stair. I love stairs, I, I must avoid it. And what I wanted to do with this stair is something that relates directly to the Opéra de Paris, where uh, in the 19th century, they did, uh, of course, uh, Garnier, the main uh, uh, theater, the Opera Theater in Paris. But you can see in th here in this section, and it's very important to understand that, that the, the stage is as important as the theater itself. And the entrance section, where you have the main stair, where all the high-class uh, uh, bourgeoisie of the 19th century could, in the entrance here, wait, stay in the balcony and look at the people arriving and leaving the opera. So I wanted to keep this idea you see in this space here and allow the Courbevoie Society, because of this interior stair and this exterior stair, to be able, just after you enter the building, this is the exterior stair I'm sorry, going to the uh, beautiful terrace garden over in balcony over the stadium. And uh, when you arrive on the top, you see here the facade of the building directly related to the stadium where you have this kind of belvedere. And this is a terrace dedicated to a third very important element of the program, which is a marriage uh, room for 200 and 300 people. Uh, that can directly go out to this magnificent terrace. Uh, the trees here are going to be much higher in, in some years. I come back to the main plaza that we did in the south. You can see here the very strong opposition with two elements of vocabulary, strong forms and solid forms on each side. 300 seat uh, auditorium, 1,000 seat auditorium, and in between, a kind of frame giving the idea of the entrance that is here, with a kind of uh, curtain, 
which is a fa in fact a solar protection again because uh, this facade is immediately facing south and we had a lot of work to give at the same time the, the transparency that we want to keep in between the entrance at the stadium and uh, uh, protection uh, for the sun. Uh, as soon as you enter, you discover the stair, the major stair. The exterior stair, of course, is here, above. But the interior stair, as you can see here, can turn in the balcony. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, you understand clearly that all this movement, again, in the depths of the building, is a movement that can allow people to meet, and not only to meet, of course, but to have the image, all of them together in the same space. And this is what I like to work, and what I like to work in this building, apart uh, the interior of the auditoriums I'm going to show to you. But the movement and the fact that people can really have a strong emotion in uh, in the participation of to this architectural promenade again uh, directly connected to the stadium space. The large auditorium itself that can be a completely flat surface because all the seats can re be removed in 20 minutes and because this uh, big auditorium can be a flat surface we ima imagine imagined also a very large urban north window that you can see here on the one side of the stage so that for example if you have a dance show or if you have a, I don't know uh, business uh, ceremony that you use at the same time also which is not classical in this kind of uh, auditoriums natural light inside again the view from exterior the way at night it changes completely because during the sun this is the stone the becomes almost white and as you saw before the glass here is dark but as soon as the night starts the idea is that the light is coming from the center from the curtain because it's uh, an exhibition and a, a show place cultural element you see here the difference you see during the day the glass is completely dark and the stone completely white with the natural light and I come back to this this is a very important change in the building during the day and night the plaza which uh, the all the city and the mayor are really proud now all the other architects in the competition decided to line up the building with the boulevard because they thought that the vision of the stadium was not something you could rely directly so they decided to move the building and to have it on the left here without any public plaza that was not asked at all in the program and i think the fact that we won this competition for different reasons one of the main being that we proposed this large public uh, space is something that gives me a lot of hope for the future because you know for uh, I, I don't know if it's exactly the same here in Italy, but uh, the tendency in France is all public space now has to be enclosed. The security thing, the security issue makes that uh, uh, it's not allowed anymore to propose large s solid soil areas, uh, plazas, because everybody is afraid with the crowd, everybody is afraid with young people outside. And uh, I'm very proud that we were able in this competition to propose not only the building that I saw to you, but also th this public project uh, for the plaza. And this is the last image we proposed also, and uh, this is under study at the moment, that uh, with the artist that uh, I showed you before, we could at night give more intensity to this public space and to this plaza with uh, uh, lead colored uh, control of these uh, glass vertical elements. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much to Carlos Arroyo and thank you very much to Jean Mas and two great lessons of architecture.